Kara, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to be back. So excited to talk to you. So, okay, I want to start by painting a picture. It's 2012 and you're sitting in something uh, you guys call the ready room, which sounds terrifying to me, but it's basically a tiny dark room in which you and all of your competitors sit before you're about to race um, for a spot on the Olympic team. So I was reading as you were writing about this and you said that normally you're very good at focusing your mind during really intense moments, but suddenly you start spiraling into neg negative thoughts. Uh, tell me about that moment. Yes. So you, you've done a pretty good job of describing the ready room. Um, I'm going to add one tidbit to it. So the event that I swim is the 50 free, which is just one lap. So it's the only event in swimming where you start from the other end um, versus like the normal start end. And the ready room in the 50 free is different from all the ready, the ready rooms from all the other events. And so we are typically in like a janitor's closet. There's a mop in the corner, like a flickering light bulb somewhere, sometimes just a toilet, just for no reason. So it's like, it's a really, um, it's a, it's an interesting environment. And you're sitting in there with the seven other people that you're about to walk out with, um, and race in, in front of millions of people. And you want nothing more than to beat them <laughs> like with everything in your being in about five minutes. But in the meantime, you just have to kind of sit with your feelings and mentally get yourself ready. So in 2012, um, I was going to, I was going to try to make my third Olympic games and the Olympic trials are crazy intense in swimming. You have to get first place or second place in finals. So you go through prelims, you go through semifinals. It doesn't matter if you're a world record holder. It doesn't matter if you're an Olympic gold medalist. If you do not get first or second in that moment, you don't make it. Even if your name is Michael Phelps, <laughs> it just, you don't make it. So it's, it's very intense. And, um, I remember sitting in the ready room and, um, things just hadn't been going my way. And, and, you know, another thing about my event, it's on the last day. It's the last event. And it's like day eight of a swim meet. And there's no chance after this 50 free for anybody to make the Olympic team. So, um, I say they save the best for last, but I had been thinking about all the things that had gone wrong. I think just as humans were like more inclined to, it's easy for us to go down the path of negativity, all the reasons why we can't be successful, all the things that we think other people are maybe thinking about us instead of really building ourselves up internally. And so I let that easy path come through my mind and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I've had like this bad back problem for the last four years. Um, you know, I've, I've had to switch teams and switch programs. I, I haven't been swimming well. How could I possibly get first or second place right now in this 50 free? And all of these like, you know, negative thoughts going through my mind. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I am about to walk out on national TV and swim in Olympic trials for a chance at my third Olympic team. What am I doing? I, if I've learned anything in 21 years, it's that 21 years of swimming. It's that if I don't think I can succeed, if I don't think I'm going to, to do well, then it's not going to happen. Like my parents can believe in me, my, my teammates, my coaches, my everybody in the world can believe me. But if I don't believe in myself, I know it's not going to happen. So what can I do to try to get into that mental state? And I don't know if you've ever like gone down the rabbit hole of like bad attitude, bad mood. And you're like, wait, think positive. Like, how do I just turn that on? Yeah. How do you turn that on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, think positive. I'm like, that's not working. And I was like, okay, how did I even get here? Like what got me sitting in this moment right now? And I thought back to, um, when I was seven years old and I watched the Olympics on TV for the first time. Um, and I was like, wow, I want to be an Olympic swimmer someday. And I thought back to, um, in fifth grade, we did a project on what we're going to be when we grow up. And I held up my poster board in front of my whole class and said, when I grow up, I'm going to be an Olympic swimmer. And I thought about all the times that I got out of bed at five o'clock in the morning and jumped into an ice cold pool. And I pushed my body until my lungs burned and my muscles ached because I wanted to be an Olympic swimmer. And all of these thoughts came through my head, these beautiful memories of, you know, what literally led me to that moment. And I was like, oh, this is, this is actually much easier than I'm making it. All I have to do right now is go out there and give this my best effort and honor that seven-year-old girl 
that have this dream. That's all I have to do. And trying my best is going to be good enough. Whether I make it or not, it's okay because I'm putting myself on the line. I did everything I could to get to this place. I'm just gonna, you know, have a good time with it. And whatever happens, happens. To be realistic, I was like, eh, I'm probably good enough for fourth place today. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's the shortest event in swimming. It comes down to literally a hundredth of a second, you know, between making and not making, which is a strand of a hair. But wow. Uh, I, I was so relaxed walking out and, um, it's, it's my favorite race of all time because, um, you know, and, and it is funny too. I, I didn't go a best time in this swim. I didn't, I didn't win. I didn't break a record, all things that I've done in the past, but it's my favorite race because I was able to change the outcome of that race before it started and walking out behind the blocks. I was like having a good time, you know, I'm like, I'm probably going to retire after this. Like how, how, what a great way to go out. I, I hear my brothers, I'm waving and, um, I stepped up on the blocks and the gun went off and I dive in kicking and pulling as hard as I can down the pool. And I, I touched the wall and I looked up and, you know, just like that moment of time, like, did this really just happen? And I was almost having a hard time. Is that a two or a seven? Like, I don't want to be that person that celebrates seventh place, by, you know, not making it. And in the line of sight, I could see my brothers. I have two older brothers. Um, and they were in my line of sight to the clock and their arms are up. They're going crazy. And I was like, wow, it worked. I, I did it. And I thought I just retired, but now I swim for another four weeks, but <laughs> that's okay. What's, what's really amazing about that video. And I will actually include it in the article when I write it is when you step out on the blocks, you have this like smirk, but it's like a confident smirk. It's so funny. Whereas kind of your competitors just, you know, they're getting ready, but you're just standing there like a wonder woman. Like I am going to do this. You don't know what's coming. And I love that. Um, but so, okay. So you, you make it to the Olympics and I love that you talk about that. This was actually your favorite race because for this interview, I decided to kind of, um, talk a little bit about your journey to that race. So, um, the, the string of events that led up to that moment, I mean, talk about adversity. Like you had been to the Olympics twice already. So the first time you went, you were 18, correct? Yep. And so then um, for the third time, you decided to train with a high school swimmer named Missy Franklin and move out to Colorado. Tell me about that decision. Yeah, um, I was training in Southern California with a professional team um, that I had moved out in, I think, 2009. And my intention was to, um, you know, 2009 is a pretty decent amount of time before 2012. So to make a drastic change, like a new team and a new coach, I felt like it was a good amount of time for that decision to really set in and for me to hit a good, you know, pace with my coach and build that trust and relationship. And that team fell apart within one year. Um, the coach completely left swimming, of course, through scandal. And I was forced to do, relocate to a new program. And I had, I had heard about an up and coming high school girl, um, named Missy Franklin in Denver. And at that point, you know, going for my third team, I was one of the oldest people still swimming in the sport, um, you know, in my mid twenties at the time and, and qualifying for three Olympics isn't super common. And so I was like, you know what, maybe I need a change of scenery and swimming with somebody younger might be really good for me. And so I, I moved out to Denver and training with Missy was really special because there's a, actually a 10 year age difference between the two of us. We're both six feet tall. We're both fair skin, brown hair. Like we look actually a lot alike, but I am 10 years older than her. And I was going for my third games while she was trying for her first. And so it was almost like I got to experience everything for the first time again, through Missy's eyes, like everything was exciting again, everything was new again. And it, it breathed new life into me. Um, unfortunately that program just wasn't a good fit. I, as much as I tried to make it work, I couldn't fit a square peg in a round hole. And, um, I had to leave again about three months before trials, one last ditch effort to a different team on the other side of the country. Um, because I got to a point where it was, you know, maybe April of 2012, Olympic trials were in June. And I was like, I know if I stay here in Colorado, I'm not going to make the Olympic team. So I can either 
hang it up right now and, and put myself out of my misery and not experience going to trials and, and just feeling terrible about myself, or I can do a Hail Mary and I can move one more time, which moving back in 2009 was a big deal. Moving again to Colorado in 2010, like it was just so much. And so, um, I gave it everything I had. I, I called the coach in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I was like, Hey, really need a new program. Um, it's three months before trials. I understand if, if it's a no, um, but I just wanted to give it a try. And he said, um, and I've known this coach, uh, for a long time. He's very, very, um, successful Olympic coach for years. And he's like, Carolyn, are you swimming for the next three months to finish out your contracts and, you know, just say that you did it? Or are you swimming to make the Olympic team? And I was like, coach, I'm swimming to make the Olympic team. And he was like, okay, welcome aboard. And so I, I moved again, <laughs> um, but it ended up paying off. And, um, you know, it was definitely that storyline running through my head in the ready room. Like that was like, this is crazy. How could I possibly think that those things are going to help me? Um, but in the end, I, that like really trusting your gut, like, Hey, I'm not in the right place right now. And no matter how hard I try to make it right, it's just not going to happen. I can keep everybody happy and stay where I am and, and, you know, be quiet and sit in the corner and do what I'm told. And then at the end of the day, personally be extremely let down, or I can stir the pot, <laughs> get up and go and, um, and see what happens. So I actually think this is a very interesting um, skill set to have and mindset to have in both sport and business life, just knowing when something is wrong for you and, and, and moving and, and taking action to get out of that situation. So there's actually, um, for those of you watching, there's a documentary about um, Carolyn and uh, Missy called Touch the Wall in which this whole journey is documented. And watching that, it was so, it was so interesting because um, you could see how you really wanted to stay for Missy, but also you knew that it, it wasn't, the coach wasn't the right match for you. Did you realize the mismatch between you and the coach pretty early on and, and kind of stuck around to see, or, or when did you realize it? Oh, you're, this gives me kind of chills. Nobody's ever asked me this. Um, I realized it, um, probably within the first four to six weeks of moving to the program. Wow. Um, I, I was just kind of waiting for that feeling, that affirmation of, okay, this is a good relationship. This is a very trusting relationship. Um, you know, he is, uh, making promises or declarations that he is seeing through and it just wasn't happening. And, um, it, it, yeah, it was probably less than two months. I was like, oh no, oh no. And I held on for one year totally. Um, start to finish. It was, it was one year with that program. And at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's just like relationships and some people are a good fit and some people are not. And, um, but I think having the ability to recognize that in yourself too is really important. And it doesn't mean that that person is flawed. It just means that that's not a good fit for you. Totally. And, uh, there's one part in that documentary that just kind of like shook me. And I think I, it was like, no. So <laughs> I definitely said that because it was very apparent that uh, Missy was so excited because this was her first Olympics and she's so, so excited in your seasoned and your experience. And for you, this is your job to perform. Um, so the one part that I remember very clearly is I didn't know this, but apparently USA Swimming offers like a $30,000 stipend for certain competitive swimmers who qualify for certain events. Um, so you can, you know, pay your rent. So there was a qualifying event and then the words on the screen read, um, Carolyn Joyce missed her funding by 0 0.03 seconds. And I just froze. I cannot imagine that much pressure on one event. And you're, you, you're suddenly not only like, oh, I'm not doing this for the love of swimming, but like suddenly I'm out of $30,000. How does that feel? Yeah. Um, that was uh, probably one of my lowest points as an athlete. Um, it was, so that exact thing happened exactly one year before Olympic trials. Um, the year where that stipend is probably the most important and the most valuable because training as an Olympian 
is a full-time job. I mean, there aren't enough hours in the day for all the things that you have to do as an athlete, truly. And so having a stipend to supplement um, any other income you might have, sponsor dollars if you're lucky, things like that is so vital. And <laughs> the, you know, the amount of time that I missed it by, um, it stung pretty bad, but I don't think I was, I mean, I was still training with the, the wrong program at that time. And I was like, I know that this, you know, one place and this pretty bad scenario is not a reflection on how hard I've been working or how bad I want this. Um, and so I'm going to stick around for another year and keep training for the Olympics, but I'm going to have to make some lifestyle changes to be able to afford, you know, a $30,000 pay cut essentially. Totally. So, okay. So during this time, can you go into some really specific detail about what your training regimen was like? Yeah. Um, so depending on what program I was at, um, what team I was on, um, we would swim one to two times per day. Um, so like throughout college, I swam nine times per week. Oh, wow. Uh, as I got older, it was more, um, probably six to eight times per week. And your body just, <laughs> the older we get, the longer it takes to recover. Um, in my last year training for the Olympics, I was in the pool about two to three hours per day. And then um, an hour and a half to two hours on either weightlifting or some kind of um, yoga or Pilates, um, you know, like strength building, stretching exercises. Um, you're constantly, you know, working on your recovery. Um, even in the last months, I think I went to the chiropractor, uh, every single day, the last three wow. months that I was training just to keep my back, um, together because I was in so much pain and doing all of that, you know, you're, you're training, you're cooking for yourself. You are, um, you know, going to the doctor, you're just trying to keep your body as healthy as possible. And it, it's literally a full-time job. <laughs> so you've been at this point, you had been to the Olympics twice before. Why do that to your body again? <laughs> I, I, so I think this is something that a lot of people can probably relate to. I don't think it's just unique to athletes, but, um, after the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, I was 22 and I was, I was pretty happy with how I had swum, but I still had that fire inside of me where I was like, this isn't as good as I'm going to be. Like, I know I can actually still be better. And if I stop now, like, what do I do with this fire? It's going to keep burning and I'm going to go crazy. And so, um, you know, that was really what led me to continue training for four years because it's not so much about, I want more medals or I need more recognition. It's this desire to know how good am I capable of being? What is my body truly capable of my mind and my body? And wanting to just see that through and honor my body in that way. And, um, I think that's a big part of, of what drove me, but that can be so many things, you know, working for a company for 20 years and be like, I actually think that I've hit the end of my road professionally. I think my growth is, you know, as high as it's going to be. And it's probably time for me to step away and go do something else. But inside those 20 years, you still had that fire burning. Like, I know I can keep climbing. I know I can keep improving. I know that there's more that I can do right here in this position. And so, um, you know, jumping ahead to 2012, when I was sitting in the ready room, that fire was like, ooh, like just dwindling. And I was, I had this epiphany. I was like, I think I'm as good as I'm ever going to be right now. And if there is ever a time to hang it up, it's, it's after this. I think this is the right time, but like, what a gift as an athlete, you know, to not have to retire because of, um, you know, high school or college graduation or an injury or financial reasons just to be able to retire because it's time. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful that I was able to have that. Also, I cannot believe that you retired at 26 years old. I mean, in any other industry that is absurd, but in swimming, it's like a feat. Um, so <laughs> grandma, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so you, you've said that you are a really big student of swimming in that you spend a lot of time studying the really successful people, uh, behind, you know, anything, anything that they've done to be successful. Can you talk about the importance of people focused learning and how that's helped you? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I'm actually, you know, being a, a student of the sport for 21 years and now being retired, now I'm just a huge nerd of the sport. Like, I'm like I have all this useless knowledge on swimming with nowhere to take it. Um, but it just makes me, I'm just a big swim fan now. Um, but as an athlete, and I, I know I definitely saw a difference throughout my career with the advancements in technology, but um, being able to study people that are doing what I want to do, but better is uh, like the greatest, you know, teacher. It's the greatest learning experience. And I, I loved going to meets and, you know, just standing on the side of the, it doesn't matter what event it is. I swim the 50 freestyle, but I can still learn something from people swimming the 100 breaststroke or the individual medley or whatever it is. And studying people's strokes, their breakout, how they're operating, how their body is moving through the water. And what are they doing really well that I can apply to my own self and my growth in the water and, you know, make improvements in that way. And I am literally the exact same with business now. Um, like how can I, you know, as an entrepreneur, what can I do that other successful entrepreneurs are doing? You know, it's, it's more common, I think, to talk about in the business world, but as athletes, it's, it's like the greatest gift is having video review or being able to watch people's races from, you know, halfway around the world and learn from that. Um, so, and also, you know, my race being as, as close as it is hundredths of a second, it's, I equate the 50 freestyle and swimming to the balance beam and gymnastics. Like Simone Biles isn't going to pop on the balance beam and be like, okay, what am I feeling like today? Like one twist, maybe three flips. I don't know. I'll see how, like every time she gets on the balance beam, she does the same routine with the goal of getting it as close to perfection as possible. And it's the same thing with the 50 free. Every time you step up on the blocks, your goal is to get as close to perfection for your race as possible. Everything's mapped out ahead of time. Everything is pre-planned and you know, being a student of the sport, I think is almost even more important for sprinters because we don't have wiggle room to make a mistake. And improvise. Um, so that played a huge part in, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What am I feeling today? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how I wake up and write. Like, what do I feel like today? You know, <laughs> So this is, re I love this because I've always said that, um, like I'm not the most talented writer, I'm not the best writer, but I probably am one of the most consistent because I write all the time. And so for you, for swimming, the people who go to the Olympics, they're not good. They're the best in the entire world. So what, being a student of the sport, what have you learned it separates the great from the really, really great. Like what are those tiny qualities or skills that you've identified from studying so many people? That's a great question. I think there's the obvious. It's like so the, our size, you know, like I have really big hands. Um, so that really helps in swimming. I'm also six feet tall. That also yeah. helps. Um, everybody knows like Michael Phelps body is like the ideal, you know, he's the fish on land. It's the ideal swimmer's body, broad shoulders, um, long torso, flexible joints. There's that, which I think is the obvious, but then I would say the thing that, that separates the, the good from the great is I think it's focus. And I actually learned this from, from watching Michael for so many years, uh, we were on you know, three Olympic teams together and being a student of the sport, always watching him behind the blocks and just knowing the person that he is outside of the water and then seeing the person that he is behind the blocks when he's ready to dive in. Um, it was maybe a, a few years, um, before I retired, but I was like, wait a minute, this guy can focus like on another level. And it's something that you can see in LeBron James and Serena Williams and Tiger, it's like the best athletes in the world have this incredible ability and scale for focus that most of us don't have. And, and I, I understand, you know, I, I am an Olympian, but I even look at Michael and I'm like, I have only a fraction of what he has. Um, you know, I, I understand I do have a, a really good ability to focus, but I'm not on his level. Um, but I, I think that's probably one of the biggest things. That's so interesting. Do you think that some of that focus, so for example, right before a really high pressure situation, like an Olympic event, uh, a lot of, I've read about Michael Phelps and a lot of other um, swimmers have these small rituals that they do. Does that help you get in the zone? Is, is that a thing? Like, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think rituals 
like really small rituals are easy to accomplish, easy, whatever that is. Like I, um, I don't know. I always take off my right shoe first when I get behind the blocks. There's something really simple, but you know, as you progress as an athlete, you go from, um, local games or competitions where, um, your mom can make, you know, your favorite spaghetti the night before, and you get your pillow in the car on your drive and, um, all of these like really nice things, nice to haves. And as you get older and you start in, start improving, now you're traveling um, across the country or you're traveling across the world and you're swimming in a time zone where it's like three in the morning at home, but now you have to be at your best and you don't have that lucky spaghetti dinner or your pillow. So I think a lot of athletes, as we kind of improve and get better, the rituals that you have and the good luck things that you do get a little bit less and a little bit smaller. Um, and it's just about what are the things in your life and in your circle, no matter where you are, that you have control over? What is what does that look like? So for me, you know, a ritual is the night before a race, I lay everything out on my bed wherever I'm at in the world, and I pack my bag for my for the next day. I have my suit ready, I have my backup suit, I have my warm fuzzy socks, I have all the stuff, my towel, everything that I need. And as I pack and put it, you know, in the order that I will need it the next day. I try to visualize my race. What's it going to feel like when I dive in the water? What's the water going to feel like rushing over me? What's it going to feel like through my, my back and my arms as I extend in the water? And that gets me ready. But those are things that are really easy and that I can take with me everywhere. So um, my rituals definitely got more simple, I would say, as I, as I progressed as an athlete. That's really cool. And, and just out of curiosity, so when you were in the ready room and you went down this negativity spiral, I think a lot of regular people would have those negative thoughts, but they wouldn't have the awareness to know like, hey, stop it and visualize something better. Did that take you a while or have you always been kind of a visual person? Um, I think I learned that through swimming races where I knew I was not in a good headspace. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's great about this sport in particular. Um, every single time you compete in this sport, it goes straight back to you and your performance and your effort at that moment. Nobody's passing you a ball. Nobody is, um, you know, doing anything that can affect you. It's just you and the clock every single time. And so, uh, being able to reflect after a race, like, why did that go so bad? Or at the end of a season, like I really did not compete to the level that I could have. What are the things that, that I could improve on? And just being reflective after things don't really go as you had hoped or predicted. Um, I mean, that's one of the best things that we can do is learn from our mistakes and, and also, you know, not, I think not take your mistakes too hard and know that, Hey, I, I did make this mistake and that's a good thing. It's one more thing I can check off that I know not to do next time. Um, and just be better for it. Amazing. So you went to the Olympics for the first time at age 18 and then you retired at 26, uh, which is so incredibly young. I think in the documentary, when, um, I think the coach was saying like, uh, Kara, like you're in your twenties. And I was like, Oh my God, that is not old. Please let's, <laughs> let's not talk about it like that. But so when you retire, did you ever fear that you had peaked too early? Cause you reached the peak of your career so early on that you were kind of scared that you would get lost with what to do next. Yeah. So here's the thing with retiring. And I, I always get a chuckle when people are like, wait, you retired at 26. I'm like, I, yeah, I did. And, and it truly is retirement, you know, when you have some kind of career path or, um, you know, something that you're very passionate about that comes to a, a complete end and you have to move on to what's next and doesn't matter how old you are. If you're 26, if you're 60, if you're 75 and you're retiring from something, it can feel like the rug is pulled out from under you. You go from being accountable to something or someone every day to all of a sudden nothing. And I think that probably the biggest thing that I feared was not finding something that I was as passionate about um, in retirement. Cause I didn't know what that was gonna be. I, I, when I retired, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, but I would say my biggest fear was like, what if I don't find something that I love? And, and I, I have gone from knowing the greatest passion and, and just loving something so much. I need to like, I have to have that again. 
but what if I don't? Yeah. So, okay. So I love this for multiple reasons, but one of them being that I spent kind of the my 20s really at Fortune Magazine and my title was editor and writer at Fortune Magazine. Any room I walked into, people were like, oh, that's such an important title. She must be important. So then when I left to do the profile full time, I was like, oh my God, like what is my identity now? But luckily by starting the profile, I was able to tie my identity to my name, which I think is the most powerful thing you can do. And you did something similar in that your second act was starting a business for yourself and for a cause that you genuinely believe in. How did you decide to do that? Yeah, gosh, being an entrepreneur, like you're just a different kind of crazy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's not, it's not stated enough. Um, so when I retired, um, like I said, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but, um, I had this like weird, um, I'll never forget this moment, you know, after the Olympics, their Olympics end in August at some point, but right when you're done, I mean, there's a lot of travel and demand that you're doing, um, whether it's a speaking engagement or, um, I think one year we went on the season opener of Oprah. Um, we go to the white house to meet the president. So you're, you're, back from the Olympics, but you're still kind of in this big, like frenzy of being an Olympian and being celebrated for your accomplishments. And it was, um, I think it was October of 2012. I was sitting on my couch and I was like, wait a minute, I have nothing to do today. Like, it was just like the first time ever. It hit, like nothing is going to happen today unless I go do something like no one's expecting me anywhere. And I made a commitment that because I don't know what's next, the best thing I can do for myself is to say yes to everything that comes my way. So any job offer, any speaking engagement, um, anything, anything somebody offers me, I'll be like, yep, I'm, I'm doing it. I'll, I'll be there. I'll show up because just by process of elimination, I'm going to know what I like and what I don't like. And hopefully something will stick. Um, I began working a lot with, um, I I began coaching. Um, so at one point I think I had like five different jobs, but one of my jobs, I was teaching private lessons at a swim school, um, called swim labs in Denver. And my client list, I'd never advertised, like I'm teaching lessons, come get a lesson with me. I was like, ah, you know, I'm going to say yes to this. I'm going to do it. And if I'm good, people will come. If I'm not, I'm going to know that this is something to move on from. And, um, my client list really started to grow uh, organically by word of mouth. And it was, uh, primarily teenage girl swimmers that would come and get a lesson. And the wait list to get a lesson was, I don't know, probably seven or eight months long. And people would be flying into Denver with their daughter. Like, Hey, we've heard such great things. Um, you know, she's been really upset with her performance or she's having a hard time on her team or her confidence behind them, whatever it is. Can you help her? I don't even care if she gets in the water. Can you just talk to her? And it became this completely other thing separate from, Hey, let me help you with your technique with this video playback and help you get better. And so I just kind of realized like, man, I'm, I'm not doing enough for this demographic that clearly needs more. I have a lot of the answers, but I don't have all the answers. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not, you know, a sports psychologist. I'm not a lot of things. Um, I can speak on my experience, but I'm just not an expert. And a few other things ha- happened in that time. Um, one of my other jobs that I had, I, I quit and I had just been invited to attend the ESPNW summit. So I don't know if you're familiar with the ESPNW summit, but it's, it's a great event and it's for pretty much every woman that has a tie or connection to sports. So you can go there and there'll be professional female athletes. There'll be women who work in sports journalism. There'll be um, women who work for companies that sponsor like Toyota will have a ton of women there. Um, so it's, it's a really broad group. Um, and I think Robin Roberts was the MC the year it went. So it was incredibly inspirational. And I took my last paycheck from the job that I had just quit. And I was like, Phew, don't know what I'm going to do next. I have this paycheck. I have an invitation to buy a ticket to this event. I have $2,500 in my hand. This ticket is $2,500. I am going to attend the ESPNW summit and it's going to change my life. I don't know how it's like that Indiana Jones, like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like he has to take that step and it's invisible. I don't know how this is going to change my life, but I know it's going to, and I'm going to take that risk. 
And about a month after I had attended that summit, you know, I was, I was on such a high. Um, I was like, wait a minute, these girls that need so much more, um, I could just create an event for them where they get that experience that I just had. You know, they treated me like a queen at ESPNW and these girls deserve that. And so a lot of those things really led to starting the lead sports company where we have live events. Um, we bring in specialists in leadership, confidence, nutrition, mental health, um, you name it. And then a handful of female Olympians and girls get to come for four days, get treated like absolute Queens and learn from not just their heroes, their Olympic heroes, like Missy and Elizabeth Beisel, like these crazy, amazing women, but they also get to learn from specialists. Um, and, and these are topics that they're very passionate about. You know, they all love being athletes, but they don't really have the access or, or, you know, resources to get with, yep. you know, the best of the best women, um, that, you know, I've been fortunate in my network to be able to, to have relationships with, but, you know, opening that door to the next generation, like, Hey, you should be learning from these women too. They're incredible and it can really help. So, so, Okay. The one theme in your life journey is very much that you are willing to take the step into the unknown because you just know, like, I don't know if this is going to be successful. I just need to move. And when you wrote a guest post for the profile um, in 2018, I believe it was, um, you said this line, as I've learned in swimming, the antidote to doubt is action. And that's something that I recently also heard um, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson say, which is that when he was super depressed and sad, he would learn to take action, which for him meant going to the gym. Um, Why do you think action is so powerful, even in times of great uncertainty? Um, I think action is, it's, it's one of the best things that we can do. Um, I, I recently, I heard a quote, um, and it was about people who suffered from trauma Mm -hmm. and if you suffer from trauma, you kind of come to a fork in the road where you can sit in your trauma and, and be there forever, or you can move past it. And moving past it doesn't mean you don't acknowledge it, but it means that it happened and you're going to continue to move forward. And I think that is such a healthy way to approach things that, um, you know, it doesn't have to be traumatic, but a lot of people do experience depression. A lot of people do get down or feel stuck. And the thing that you can control is your response to it. So am I going to sit in it or am I going to move past it? And I am definitely not a risk averse person. I know that for sure. Um, <laughs> definitely I don't, not. Make, I don't, I try not to, you know, like make crazy risks. I, I do try to be very calculated and, and think it through. Um, but I, I think the best thing that we can do when we have those feelings and, and even, even just getting to the point where you can acknowledge where you're, where you are, um, having that self-awareness is huge. And then once you're there, okay, what can I do about it? And, and I, Hey, I went through this. I wonder if other people are going through this too. Maybe I can help them because if I did it, it was probably a good chance that somebody else is, is going through it too. That's amazing. So <clears throat> some of the, some of the lessons that you've learned from the amazing women that you've met and also by training with Missy, the, the reason I love that documentary so much is because yes, it's one of competition, but it's also one of friendship and, and confidence and like you kind of teaching her what you know. So how do you actually teach confidence? Isn't that kind of a mushy nebulous thing to get? It, uh, teaching confidence Oh, it's, it's such a cool thing. Um, so I, I, people have been like, Oh, did you, um, have you always been confident? How did you teach yourself this? And, and even girls on my team in college, some of my closest friends are like, I need to learn how to be more confident like you. And, and even in college, I was like, what does that mean? I don't, I didn't quite have the awareness, but, um, I think the way I like to teach confidence is to, um, when I'm talking to girls, like, Hey, tell me like all the good things that you have done to get here. Tell me about that set that you did. Tell me about that. What are you kidding? You were able to do that. Are you, have you given yourself the the props for that? And when you step up on the blocks and when it's time to go, you have to reflect on all of these great things that you have done. Um, or I mean, that's, that's more competition related, but, um, I have a lot of girls who are like, Hey, I, I'm, 
I'm struggling with, uh, you know, my coach. I don't, uh, I don't feel like I'm getting enough attention or, um, I don't feel like he understands me. And it's like, okay, it's time now to, for you to take a step in opening that door of communication. And so for you to go and set up a meeting, I know you're only 15 and your coach is 45, but this is a great opportunity. And all of these things though, are lessons that you learn as an athlete that carry you so far in life long after you're done being an athlete. And, um, I actually work with a professional confidence coach at, um, our summit. Her name is Kristen Shevchunas and she's incredible. Um, the way she approaches confidence different from how I approach confidence different from how, um, others do. I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I think the more young girls can hear it from women in all different ways, like which one applies to you and then go forth in in that, you know, path. Have you ever suffered from imposter syndrome? Um, yes. <laughs> all the time. All the time. Gosh, it comes and goes. Like as an entrepreneur, more so than as an athlete, but there'll be days where I will be, I'll feel so good about the future and the outlook that our business has and and um, you know, be really like crazy happy with how our team is doing and, and how Slack is lighting up. And then other days where I'm like, did I make all this up? Like what, (laughs) you know, like, how did I, is this real? And am I, is this all in my head? Um, that's, that's to me, that's imposter syndrome. And it doesn't, uh, I don't think there's like a day or time where I'm like, Ooh, I I feel like June's going to be like a tough time for it. Like, it's just like one day I'll wake up and be like, what am I doing? Yeah. It just kind of hits you. So the reason I asked you that question is because I thought, so first of all, I hate that question because it only gets asked to women. When's the last time you got, you know, a male CEO, like, do you feel like an imposter? They never do. But the reason they don't is because I think you kind of answered the question earlier when you said, basically I'm sitting in this seat, like I've made it here's how I got here. And I think that that's basically why a lot of women mostly think that they're imposters is because they're like, oh wait, maybe I shouldn't be here, but you're sitting in that seat. And I think what you're talking about in the ready room, but also talking to the girls that you now mentor, they are there for a reason. So just, just be confident. (laughs) It's not that easy, but you know what I mean? (laughs) For sure. And I think as athletes, it's, um, it's so much more quantitative to be able to, um, like this practice happened, this weight session happened. These are the metrics that I have from it. Whereas an entrepreneur, it's like, you're kind of in this like constant washing machine and you're like, I think today's a good day. And then like something bad will happen. You're like, what? like this, how did this all come crashing down so fast? Um, but I think my skills, you know, that I developed as an athlete trying to, um, you know, keep my confidence up when it was really important has definitely helped me on those like crazy days as an entrepreneur. Totally. Okay. So now we have a few questions from, uh, profile readers from Twitter, which are kind of very interesting. Um, Brent asks, what is your diet and sleep regimen look like? Oh, okay. As an athlete, I'm guessing. (laughs) As an athlete, but also now. <laughs> okay. So as an athlete, um, it's almost like you can't, as a swimmer, like you can't eat enough. <laughs> like I wish I had more time so I could eat more. I wish I was not as tired um, right now so that uh, I could get one more meal in, but the nap is going to trump anything that I'm going to do. Um, as uh, an entrepreneur, um, that's probably one of the toughest things because um, swimmers have like, very, very healthy appetites. And, um, one of the things that I've struggled with is like, wait, so I, I can't just like go and eat a 2000 calorie dinner one day. Eh, Um, I still do it. (laughs) Um, but so as an athlete, I I did try to just eat very healthy, but eat a lot, Mm -hmm. um, like probably four meals a day, um, pretty good sized meals. And, um, and I ate meat and vegetables and stuff like that. Now, um, as a non-athlete, I'm actually vegetarian now. Oh, wow. And I try to supplement, um, some things that I don't get like protein with pea protein and stuff like that, um, that I would have gotten from, from meat. But, um, again, I try to eat healthy as healthy as I can. Um, COVID, I think COVID I, time I doesn't count <laughs> because I'm not on like, like, Oh no, I have a workout at this time. So let me like reverse, like, okay, I need two and a half hours before, 
um, a workout to eat like a good sized meal or else I'll end up feeling sick. But then again, you know, half the time I'm in my car, like stepping my face on the way to practice anyway. So <laughs> weird follow-up question on that. Um, so when obviously you're not training right now, um, and you don't have an accountability coach yelling at you and telling you, you need to eat this and you need to train at this time. How do you motivate yourself just intrinsically? Or do you still kind of have that? Like you hear those, uh, coaches. Yeah. Um, so a couple things have happened since retiring. The first one was maybe within like two years of retiring. Um, just like mentally, I wasn't feeling right. Um, something was just amiss in my day and I couldn't pinpoint it. And I ended up realizing that swimming is extremely meditative. Um, you're alone in the water. You can't really hear anything except the water rushing by your ears, you're staring at a black line. Um, and you do that for hours every day. And it's almost like the motions that you have are autopilot and mindless. And you don't really have to think that much about what you're doing. So your mind gets to wander. It's also just alone time. And um, a few years after I retired, I started to go walking. So I'd put my headphones in or not, um, listen to a podcast or just kind of be with my thoughts. But I walk probably three to six miles every day now because that's that meditative state that I had been missing, that I was so used to having every day. And it's not so much for the, the physical movement as it is for the, like, this is my, my me time. And I, I just kind of need this alone time um, to get my thoughts in order. Um, and then the other thing, I got a Peloton last year, um, <laughs> right at the beginning of quarantine. Swimmers on Peloton is dangerous because we are so numbers and metrics focused. And that's like all the data. I'm like, oh my gosh, like if I can push a little bit harder here, my output is better. Um, I get so competitive on the bike. That's um, so, so funny. <laughs> that's, that's been helpful. Yeah. Anybody want to ride with me? I'm at KLPJ. Come hit me up on Peloton. We'll do a ride together. <laughs> there you go. So you still have accountability via metrics and an instructor. That's amazing. So <clears throat> Tim's question is kind of off of what you just said about the meditative quality. He said, um, I would ask her about the weird meditative state swimmers get from the suffering and the silence of the water. It's a strange common trait with swimmers. They all love the silent suffering. Do you, do you enjoy the suffering? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You, you grow to love it. And then when you don't have it, you, you miss it. That is like, so I crazy. I literally suffer on the Peloton. I'm like, this is so good. <laughs> um, but it's, it is such a unique sport. And I, I almost feel like swimmers are just like a different mental mindset than almost every other athlete because of how alone we are while we're doing our sport. Like we can't hear corrections from our coach. We can't hear our teammates calling out for us. We can't, you can't hear anything. Um, except just you know, the noise of the water, which it it's becomes kind of silent to you after a while. Um, but it's, it's a thing that a lot of swimmers crave once it's over. Um, just because I, I think it's good for you. You know, it's, it's almost like that five to 10 minute shower time that you get where you can get some really good thinking done or that short drive that you do every single day. You don't even have to think about making your turn. Um, those little moments, but over a big period of time. Um, that's, that's really what swimming is like. I feel like, I feel like I need to go swim a few laps or like run a marathon right now. <laughs> Get some thinking in, yeah. Exactly. Um, so David asks, what top sacrifices did you make to reach your pinnacle? Um, top sacrifices. I, I've never actually been able to acknowledge that term sacrifices in a good way because it's, I, you know, that's, it's funny, like sitting on an airplane next to somebody and they're like, Oh, what do you do? And it's like, don't tell the truth. Or do I make something up? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an Olympic swimmer. And the first thing people say is, Oh, I can't imagine, um, the dedication that you have and the sacrifices that you've made. And every time I'd be like, but it's just what I do. Like, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice to me because like, it's like getting up and going to work every day, getting up and going to school every day. This is just what I do. I don't, there isn't a choice in the matter. So I don't know if I could really call it, um, a sacrifice per se, but, uh, starting off, uh, the job world, getting my first job at 26, never worked in my life. <laughs> um, that was kind of tough knowing a lot of my peers that had already gone through internships and were, you know, more placed in their businesses and careers and stuff. Now, like that Kara, that was really silly to even care about that because people change careers every day. 
Um, so I don't, I don't know if, uh, I can really say that I feel like it was sacrifices, but, um, it was just a desire to commit to something that I was very passionate about. So I have a few more questions for you, um, before we wrap up, but one of them is that you and I actually have the same hero who is a uh, Spank CEO, Sarah Blakely. Can you tell us the story about how you met her by offering her bananas? <laughs> um, I, yeah, gosh, that was like a year ago. Pandemic year is like a blur. Mm-hmm. Um, I follow Sarah's husband, Jesse, actually. And he, um, he's big into like the entrepreneur grind and stuff like that. And Jesse, um, he talks a lot about his come up and what he did to get to where he is. And I always love those stories. And one day um, he was talking about um, how he used to get dressed really nice and go and sit in a very expensive hotel bar for hours and just see the people that he would meet and, you know, talk about whatever his product was or his business was at the time that he had. It's like, I couldn't afford to stay at the hotel, but I was going to go and have a nurse a drink for a while and just to meet people. Mm -hmm. Um, And he was like, so I'm going to be at this hotel at this time. Anybody that wants to come meet me, like, come say hi. And I shot him a DM. I was like, Hey, this is actually down the street from me. I'd love to meet you. Um, we ended up meeting the next day and I brought, I brought him some bananas and smoothies and I brought Sarah some Cheez-Its and we sat down for a while. Um, they have their oldest, um, son is a swimmer and we talked about swimming. We talked about business, entrepreneurship and stuff like that. Um, but it was, yeah, it was such a a cool thing to, to meet them and, and get to hang out. And as a CEO yourself, what did you like about Sarah's story that you've implemented in your own business? I, yeah, I first heard Sarah's story on the podcast, um, how I built this. I, I think she was his first guest too. It was so good. It's so good. <laughs> you like, you laugh with like yeah. along with her. Um, she has such a, a great personality and she's such a good storyteller of her, of her story in a very relatable way, even though I don't do anything with undergarments and, <laughs> uh, you know, spanks where it's, it's so relatable just in a human way. Um, but I think the thing about Sarah that, aside from her relatability is, um, she just was never going to stop. You know, there was never a point in time where it was like, okay, I, I really tried and I didn't make it on Oprah's favorite things this year. So this is the end for me, which, you know, ended up happening for her and really, um, helped her brand. But I've had people in the last year, cause it's been an extremely hard year for anybody in business, uh, most people in business. And I've had a lot of people in the last year be like, you thought about just kind of hanging it up for your company. I mean, we operate in live in-person events in sports, which completely vanished for quite a while. And I was like, no, no, there's, this is what I do. And there has never been a time where I have gotten to the end of the road. I mean, like I've done everything I can in girls leadership and development for athletes. And I'm, I'm done here. Like that's, it's not even an option and I haven't exhausted everything. So um, I think that's something that I, I always loved about her story was like, she was just going to keep going. She's going to sell fax machine, machines while she's building her undergarment business. And that's just the way it is. Um, so I, I love that part of her story. That's amazing. Which leads me to, you said that you heard this quote from a coach once. Uh, he said, success is contagious. So what, why did that stick out to you? Yeah. Uh, and that was my coach, Jack Bowerly from Georgia. Success. Oh yeah. We both went to Georgia. I always forget yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. Um, success is contagious. I think as an athlete, there's nothing better than seeing your teammates do really well. So especially let's, let's say at swimming, um, we, we show up to a really big meet and the first event, you know, our teammate swims and, and just completely crushes their time or, or whatever it is. Um, you're so happy for them, but then you're also like, wait, I've been, I've been swimming next to them every day. Like I probably have good things coming my way too. And, and just that, that mental power that that gives you in that moment, um, that's contagious. And my coach, he said this to me, um, it was actually at Olympic trials in 2016. I was like, coach, your team is, is crushing it right now. I'm so proud of these Georgia Bulldogs. And he was like, you know, since the first race of this meet, um, we, the, the dominoes have been falling because success is contagious. And, when you allow yourself to really be happy for other people, I think as women, um, that's almost like we 
are ingrained to think that someone else's success is my failure or someone else's success is taking something away from me. And that's not the case at all. And when you realize like, hey, if I'm really happy for this person, if I can lean into their success and see what they're doing, I can have that too. And there's enough for all of us. Um, so I, I do, I love that success is contagious and like hop on the bandwagon because it's, it's still moving. I love that. And my final question for you is, what does the word success mean to you? Oh man, um, I think success is at the end of the day, I, I tried my best. I, I did what I was capable of doing and I'm proud of the effort that I gave. Um, because as an athlete, I think it can be really hard to get tied up in other people's external opinion of success. Like I'm a four-time Olympic silver medalist. You'd be shocked at how many times people are like, I'm so sorry for your failure to win a gold medal. No, I'm "I'm sorry that that's what you think, (laughs) but somebody else's idea of success can be tied into my idea of success. And I had to learn that as an athlete. So for me as a business owner, um, I don't, I don't have illusions of like, we're going to be a unicorn company. And if we're not a unicorn company, then we're not successful. That's, that's not the case at all. To me, success is, am I doing something that's making a difference? Am I truly making an impact? Am I using my skills to the, the, the best that I can at the end of the day, if, if I can say yes to that, then I can put my head on my pillow and and rest easy and know like this has been a success. And to come full circle from the story that you told in 2012, where that race wasn't your best time, you know, wasn't like you didn't get first place or whatever, but it was your favorite and you probably felt successful because you gave it your full effort, right? Exactly. Yes. And so someone else looking at that race might be like, she got second. Like she didn't even go best time. You know, she, she missed out on all these markers that I think of success. But for me, I'm like, it doesn't matter what you think. (laughs) You're not, you're not in the arena. So your opinion doesn't matter. Uh And so I, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that has carried over from being an athlete. I, I love that. If you're not in the arena, your opinion does not matter. Love that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kara. This was amazing. My pleasure.